Um, and I know 20 minutes is very, very short. Yeah. And you have a big story. Mm -hmm. um, so this is your opportunity, you know? What, what, was, what, what did you have to cut out of those 20 minutes <laughs> uh, that you feel like actually was worthwhile well, saying? It's, it's interesting because um, this one, for, for better or worse, I, I... Talk to the microphone, please, for this video. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Um, for, for better or worse, I decided to go for something that was more process-oriented, how, how, how I think about building an org, and specifically how, how I think about eliciting creativity when you're, you have very specific business goals. Um, that's a huge topic, right? So <laughs> I, guess, I guess the answer is uh, most of it. It was, a, it was very much a survey. Um, but I think the... The thing that I've, I've found with working with, um, you know, a, a ton of companies who are going through this phase of like moving from um, being founder-led and, and, and a small team to kind of through that, that growth curve of building out a larger team um, is what happens very quickly is people kind of, uh, they, they tend to freak out and, and change everything and add a bunch of, uh, of uh, process in that doesn't really need to be there as long as the goals and your, your sort of North Star are very concrete. Um, and, you know, I think what, what happens so often is that, um, you know, the, we are very lucky to do what we do on, on this side. We're creating things out of, out of thin air, basically. Um, and, and hopefully people really like it and hopefully they pay for it. Um, and very quickly on that, that scale, I've seen this happen to so many founders particularly, is they add all this stuff that gets in between them and, and sort of being able to deliver for customers, being able to enjoy that, that process. Um, and the funny thing, it doesn't, doesn't have to be that way. So, um, so I think that's something I, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about, why I chose to talk, talk about that topic. Okay. Um, any questions from the audience at uh, this point? Always a reliable source for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you mentioned in the presentation that w one way to strip down processes is to try to make sure that everyone is uh, on the same goal. Mm. And concretely, uh, I'm, the, I'm playing the CTO part in my company. My co-founder is the one that is in charge with the clients, mm -hmm. customers. And I fear that sometimes we have this misalignment on what we are actually building, what's the goal. And we are trying to do all kinds of things, like writing documentation, writing things in Notion, let's... Uh, and like individually and after that sharing them between us to see if we are on the same page. And I still feel that sometimes there, are, there is this level of miscommunication, misunderstanding, so like we are talking past each other and that might be because of the different in backgrounds, me being looking more of, on the technical side, him more maybe on the business side, not understanding some of the uh, limitations. But is there something else that we can do? Like I feel that again we are we have to go to processes to try to find a solution, but are there other solutions outside of Figma diagrams and... So when you say you're, you're sort of talking past each other, is it, is it specifically about what you want to build, the type of company that you, you are, who you serve, like where, where, where are the biggest miscommunications? How the product should look like, what it should do, uh, how this specific, specific problem should be solved. Got it. Well, I think there's... Um, so there's a couple answers, I guess, to that, the way that I think about it, is high-level vision, that, that has to kind of come from, from you and be validated by customers. Um, ultimately, again, kind of writing it down and forcing yourselves to get to a place where you agree on that. But ultimately, whoever's, one person has to ultimately make the decision if there is a, is a disagreement. Um, how you should build, what you should build is a different question because that really, to me, comes from customer, customer obsession, right? And so really everything needs to be then vetted and, and uh, working with customers to understand what the, uh, what the best solution is. Um, and I think if, if you have different, different answers on that, then it's pretty easy to go out and test those. Um, what, what's the MVP version of that that you can go test? Oh, can um, I second with the question? Uh, first. So, you, like, again, uh, we can set things in clear in writing, mm -hmm. but even this layer of writing, sometimes it doesn't depict exactly what's in the mind of the person that uh, written that. Like, w 
it happens for some ideas that we're say like we're on the same page, but actually we're still understanding different things. That's because it might be the language barrier. Like mm -hmm. I'm speaking, I'm thinking Romanian. We are using English as a translation layer between German and Romanian, mm -hmm. and the same way we function different. So words means means something different sometimes. So did did you have this problem before? How did you make? Um. Because you mentioned this this interesting idea of like trying to set. Uh, in writing and then give it to someone else to see if they understand the same thing. Who would you recommend to send this document? I, I usually use people who aren't as familiar okay. um, because I think both of you will come in with very set preconceived notions and it's yeah. really easy to interpret something the way you want to hear it yeah. rather than the way it yeah. is. Um, that's a good start. Uh, that being said, yeah, the, the communication issue is, is a difficult one. Um, I think usually as you work down from um, kind of your, your mission statement through to like the specific strategies, that's where you start to, to shake out um, where kind of the differences are. And, and we're still in a like fairly, fairly high level. Um, so I would go through that exercise of maybe saying, okay, like, what does this mean? Break it out into the, the kind of strategy that you would use to get there and seeing if you're still on the same page. Yeah. Um, ultimately, if, if it's an issue where you just don't agree on the path, okay, that, <laughs> that's, a, that's a different thing, right? Then, then someone has to be the decision maker there and you have to decide who's going to make that decision. Yeah. Um, but if it's simply like misunderstanding, then it's just reps, <laughs> you know. Thank you yeah. very much. Maybe someone else wants to ask a question. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe a standard question. Um, what are the skills that you're looking for when you hire, the skills that you're looking for in a PM when you hire one? Yeah. And the related follow-up question, what are the um, learning options that you would recommend to a PM in order to improve or acquire those skills? Oh, yeah. Okay, so, so the question is, what, what am I looking for in a PM, and then what are the, what are the learning options for a PM to, to grow into that role? Um, yeah, PM is really broad. I, I would guess that if, uh, I almost did this, is like poll the audience, everybody would say something different, um, and a lot of engineers would be like, I don't even know what they do. Um, but they come from a lot of different backgrounds, and that's totally fine. I think the things that I, I look for, kind of the, the things that were on that slide, is like, I'm, I'm looking for someone who is um, capable, like A, very curious, asking a lot of questions. I usually, in, in an interview, one of the things I look for is what questions do they ask at the end and what are they trying to understand the business even at, at the beginning? Um, that, uh, that they're empathetic and care about customers, that they're, they're asking about the, the problems, that they're able to dig into the why. Um, I don't care so much about technical ability uh, though depending on the product, that, that could be very much a concern. Um, certainly with, uh, we have a, a data PM who, who works on just the data side of the business, um, and certainly he has to be uh, fairly well versed there. Um, but I'm, I'm looking for, uh, in that kind of like Venn diagram of sort of uh, design, customer centricity, technicality, I'm looking for somebody to be fairly well versed in one of them. Um, and then I'm looking for just horsepower. Uh, I, I find that like product is, is a role that, that can be trained and most of the time product managers come from more of an apprentice system where they're, they're coming in from a lot of different places. Rarely am I hiring somebody who like went to school for product. That, that just doesn't happen. It's they learned it from, from someone else, uh, from some other uh, place or from, from Clearbit. From, um, I, I've hired a dozen PMs that are um, that never did it before, clear bit. Um, but I think the, the the most important thing, going back to like first principles, is um, their ability to take in broad amounts of data and um, synthesize from that. Um, there's there's a there's a lot of great books. Been a while since I've since I've looked, um, but. Uh, but I, again, I generally think um, people come in from a lot of different areas and then learn on the job, to be honest. Okay. Got a question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Why not? As you're asking great questions. I love it. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, especially in the beginning when, when you are you the founder and a couple of people and the product is changing continuously, uh, yep. clients are asking things, you always have to, you don't have a lot of resources and even if you have a lot of resources, you still have to be concrete on what you're, on the direction and where you're going. Uh, is there a mental process or some techniques that you develop to help you always synthesize this new information, like to always in, in, have a clear plan. In terms of like prioritization for early ideas, is that uh, is that kind of the question? Uh, mm, maybe to give a bit more context, you had a nice slide in the presentation when you said that you're hiring PMs that are capable to synthesize. Yeah. And this is, I, I'm on the same page, I think, and it's a hard process. Is right. there something that we can do to be able to zoom out and see better all this idea and to synthesize them? That's a really good question. Um, it's a very good question. I generally will always start with the problem. And so it's what, what is the problem statement that we're solving for customers? And, and everything really comes from that. Um, I think if you're, if you're starting with a solution and trying to find a problem, that's the, that's the first issue, that's a red flag. Um, but, but generally, I mean, it's a, I think the, the standard kind of PM, like a RICE prioritization model, if you're familiar, works, works great. It's called RICE. It's, um, it, uh, basically, it, there's a, a system where it allows you to um, basically take customer problems and, and uh, prioritize them relative to kind of their scope, their difficulty, et cetera. And there's, there's a bunch of different systems that different companies use. Um, I think RICE is from Intercom. Um, sorry? It is, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so I think that's a really good place to start though when you're thinking of like how do you synthesize these is what's the, what are the problems that customers are saying, figuring out what is the real pain point behind those questions because they'll, uh, often they're the same pain point and so it's sort of like take, take what customers are giving you, ask why 15 times. Uh, or five, and get to a point where you're understanding like what the root cause is. What you'll find pretty quickly is that many of them actually come from the same place, from the same need, um, and then prioritize against those needs and those customer stories. Um, that, that's generally when you're kind of like feeling your way out early, um, it helps to have sort of a, a, an easy scoring system to, to help you do that. Yeah. If they're conflicting, yeah, I would look for, look for commonalities. Uh, it, it's interesting if you if you have a few big customers that are kind of dictating your roadmap. That's a tricky place to be in, um, and so I, I, I definitely look for things that are most applicable. But this is where like a scoring model like that very quickly kind of uh, unearths the issues. Is you can actually compare. Okay, what's the impact that this is going to have on a single customer? versus how widely applicable that is and gives you sort of a, a common metric to, to weigh against. Because, and, and then there's the art side of it too, right? It's like you get to a point where it's close and then, then it comes to taste and judgment. Um, there, there's both, you know. It's always hard to say the impact between one and ten. Like when it's, when it's to totally. And, and sometimes what I'll do is if, I'm, if I am in a position where um, where I have one customer who, who needs something and I, and I haven't had any other evidence, then I'll go out to the broader market and, and do things like surveys. There's, there's various ways to, to pay for surveys. If you have a network of, of companies that are like that that maybe aren't customers but are in that market, to so just try to understand what the reach is uh, of what they're asking for. Um, it's, a, it's always a pretty dangerous place for, for most, at least SaaS businesses, to be at the whim of, uh, of a single large customer. But sometimes that's what it takes, you know. Um, a relatively obvious question um, is like a lot of tools have come out, you know, in the past half year. Yeah. So uh, you must have noticed, uh, and it changes everybody's life. And all of a sudden, you can make awesome questionnaires. You can make totally. fantastic, you know, evaluations. You can summarize things in a clever way. And yeah. and there's probably a, another hundred things that you've discovered that can be handy. So how is that sort well, of influenced? Oh, huge, hugely. Yeah. And um, I mentioned a, a PM in in the talk that that 
is basically he's like our, our no code guy. He, he goes and he just like hacks together stuff. Um, somebody like him, and it's one of those things that actually I think uh, to your question earlier about what, what to look for in a PM uh, is a very valuable skill set is, is being able to quickly um, do kind of paper prototyping that, you know, very, like, you don't want to take too much resources, but you're able to with something like GTP very often or uh, retool, things like that, to very quickly hmm. hack together a prototype that you can just get in front of customers as an alpha. Something yeah. that even before, while you're writing your PRD, you can just, like, show people some proof and see what they think. I think that's more powerful than ever, particularly with GTP as it regards to script writing, right? I yeah. mean, I, more PMs are coming to me with uh, Python scripts that they wrote that do very specific things. It's like, do you code? No, no, not at all. But now I have at least enough to write a small script that does the thing I need. Yeah. Um, so I think also from, evaluation of customer feedback, I guess. Totally. That that one has been so far. I've had a hard time with it, to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, I was able to beta test a few uh, GTP three versions of that and watch them kind of progress these. Um, evaluation tools with customer feedback. And I find that if you are pumping in very structured data, um, let's say like an MPS score, then it does a pretty good job. As soon as you start putting in Zendesk and customer emails and all of these other things, um, the, the data become, it starts, the answers start becoming more generic and not particularly useful. I think it'll get there. Hmm. But so far, it, I, I haven't been able to quite crack that nut. It's kind of like the holy grail for product people. Yeah. Where I've seen it more useful is, is kind of um, in prototyping and also in um, very quickly writing content. Yeah. You know, so much of a product manager's job is communication with the rest of the, the company. They're sort of the, the keepers of context. And that job becomes a hell of a lot easier if you can, um, yeah, automate, <laughs> automate some of it. Yeah. yeah. yeah.